In this lecture, you are going to learn about the histological structure of the heart. Hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll have a very good understanding of what endothelium is, that you'll understand the structure of the heart and how blood flows through the heart and how the pumping of the heart is controlled by the impulse conducting system and how Purkinje fibres are able to distribute impulses through the heart muscle. It's important that you understand the difference between Purkinje fibres, which are normal cardiac muscle fibres but specialised for conduction, how to distinguish those fibres from cardiac muscle that specialised to pump, to contract and move blood through the heart. It's also important that you understand the difference between the structure of cardiac muscle and smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. Now it's very, very important that you understand endothelium. Endothelium has an enormous number of functions throughout the body. And each of these functions will be dealt with in more detail in other parts of the body systems. But endothelium forms a very thin lining of all the blood vessels in our body. It has a very important function of being a barrier and only allowing certain substances to pass across the wall of this very, very small, thin epithelial lining of all blood vessels. Of course, the heart is structured in such a way that it is able to pump blood, first of all, to the lungs to be oxygenated, to then receive that blood back and pump that oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So the structure of the heart is a very important concept structure to understand. It's also very important to understand the sequence of blood flow through the heart because as I said a moment ago, the heart is structured in such a way that the sequence of blood flow through the heart is highly coordinated. And without that proper sequence of blood flow from the heart, then we would not have the ability to oxygenate our blood and to carry oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. First of all, let's explain or let's clearly understand what we mean by the term endothelium. Endothelium is a very special name given to the epithelial lining throughout the cardiovascular system. It's the thin epithelium that is in contact with the lumen of the blood vessels and even the lumen of the heart. It consists of a very flattened squamous epithelial cell. And they're also very tightly bound to each other because one of the jobs of endothelium is to be a selective barrier for transport across the epithelial surface. But endothelial cells also have an enormous number of other functions. Some of those functions I've listed on the left-hand side of this slide. And I'll refer to these functions in later lectures when I deal with their function in different organ systems. Now, first of all, let's just try and understand the structure of the heart. On the right hand side you can see a diagram. This is a diagram explaining the internal structure of the heart as if you were looking at a person standing in front of you. So look at this slide and just try to identify firstly the left atrium and the left ventricle both towards the right hand side of this slide. Once you've identified those two chambers of the heart, then move towards the other side and identify the right atrium and the right ventricle. Having done that, you've then identified the four chambers of the heart which I'll describe in a moment. But then look and see where the aorta lies. It's labeled red, and also underneath that aorta is a blue colored structure. That's the pulmonary trunk. They're important structures that I'll deal with in a moment. 
Now try and identify the SA node or the sinoatrial node. And you can see very pale lines running from that node extending into the right atrium and the left atrium. They're going to represent part of the conducting system I'm going to refer later. And finally, look at the blue circular structure towards the centre of the heart, towards the centre of the diagram. That's called the atrioventricular node. And that initiates also conduction of impulses into the ventricles. And those impulses travel through certain bundles that are shown there in blue. And I'll again refer to these later on. So that is really just to orientate yourself with this diagram so you can have some clear understanding of the structures we're going to talk about later on. There are two sorts of circulation. Firstly, there is the pulmonary circulation. This is the circulation whereby the heart receives blood from the rest of the body and then pumps that blood to the lungs. It's deoxygenated blood. It then passes through the lung and becomes oxygenated. And then it's returned back to the heart, to the left side of the heart, where that oxygenated blood is finally pumped from the heart to the rest of the body. The pulmonary circulation just refers to that circulation of blood to and from the lungs. Whereas the systemic circulation refers to the circulation of blood to all the organs of the body from the left side of the heart. There is also portal system components in the cardiovascular system. These are very strange diversions from the typical supply of blood to blood to tissues. And again, I won't mention them here except to label them on the left-hand side to remind us that there are these different systems, particularly in the liver and particularly later on when we look at the pituitary gland as part of the endocrine system. Now, I just want to make sure that we are aware of how blood flows through the heart. So on this diagram, again, refresh your memory of the chambers. And I will just briefly go through how blood flows through the heart. First of all, blood passes back to the heart from systemic tissues and enters either through the superior vena cava, which is labelled one here, or via the inferior vena cava, which is not labelled or shown in this diagram. But the essential idea is that blood passes through these two vena cava into the right atrium, labelled here too. And that right atrium then pumps that blood into the right ventricle through a valve. And that right ventricle then contracts and sends all that blood through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs, where, as I mentioned before, it becomes oxygenated. And that blood then returns, newly oxygenated, into the left atrium, where it passes from the left atrium directly into the left ventricle of the heart. And the left ventricle contracts and passes blood out through the aorta to the rest of the body. So that's the sequence of blood flow through the heart. Remind yourself of the physiology of the heart and the pumping of the heart, the atria contracting together and the ventricles contracting together. Now, let's now look again at this diagram and understand that there are three different components to the wall of the heart. First of all, the heart is lined on the outside by a thin capsule or thin membrane called the epicardium. This epicardium is, is, is actually a visceral layer of the pericardium because that epicardium reflects back on itself and creates a pericardial cavity or sac in which the heart sits and in which the heart pumps. 
And that cavity, that serous cavity, is lined by fluid. It's a very thin cavity. It's lined by fluid that reduces the friction during the beating of the heart. So the epicardium is on the outside. The thickest layer is the myocardium. The myocardium is really full of cardiac muscle. That's the work part of the heart wall. That's the part of the heart wall that does the contracting or the pumping, the myocardium. And then internally, the endocardium lines the entire inner surface of the heart. It lines the heart valves as well and the septum between the atria and also both ventricles called the interatrial and interventricular septums. So now let's look at those structures in a bit more detail. Let's look at the histology of those structures. First of all, the epicardium, the covering on the outside of the heart. As you can see from the uh, diagram and also from the histological section, it contains a lot of fatty tissue or adipose tissue. And I'm sure those of you have, who have been in a dissection lab always find that rather frustrating when you're trying to locate some of the positions of the coronary arteries. It's also composed of some connective tissue, collagen, elastic tissue, all the sorts of normal connective tissue fibres you'd expect to find in some loose connective tissue. And on the outside, it's lined by a squamous type epithelium called the mesothelium. So that mesothelium, underlying connective tissue and adipose tissue, create the outside coating or covering of the heart, the epicardium. The myocardium, as I mentioned before, consists entirely of cardiac muscle with some connective tissue skeletal components and also blood vessels. But it's mostly cardiac muscle and as I said before, that's the pump component of the heart. It's lined on top, of course, by endocardium. It's lined on top of the section here, but remember it's lining the internal chambers of the heart. So have a look at the epithelium of the uh, heart lining here, endothelium. And it consists of a squamous epithelial cell lining, as I've mentioned before. And that squamous epithelium sits on a subendothelial layer of connective tissue. It's a very thin layer of supporting connective tissue, similar to a lamina propria in other organ systems. And sometimes there's also a third layer, the subendocardial layer, again of connective tissue. And this separates the epithelial surface from the underlying cardiac muscle and in some way protects the delicate endothelial surface of the heart from the rather harsh, vigorous activity of the pumping cardiac muscle. Well, one of the things you can't really appreciate when you look at histological sections of the heart is that it actually does have a very strong fibrous skeleton. And that fibrous skeleton, very dense connective tissue, dense collagen, helps to, well, it doesn't help, it is the insertion point for all the cardiac muscle. So it's a very important component. On this slide, you can see a tiny little section taken through the myocardium of the atrium. And also you can see that there's a septum of connective tissue between both atria here and also between the ventricles. Here's a section here showing you a label of a piece of myocardium of the ventricle. Notice though that in between this myocardium of the atrium and myocardium of the ventricle, there is this clear component. That clear component is part of the connective tissue fibrous skeleton of the heart. It's a membrane that separates the atria from the ventricle. And that's very important because that then stops the wave of impulse and therefore the wave of contraction going directly from the atrium muscle to the ventricle muscle. So that it allows a delay 
And of course, that delay is very important between the filling of the ventricle and the contraction of the atrium. So it's really an electrical isolation sort of tissue there. It's very important. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the heart has got valves in it. And those valves stop the backflow of heart, uh, the backflow of blood rather, during contraction of the ventricles. And also contraction of the atrial components when blood passes from the atrium into the ventricle and then the ventricle into blood vessels. When you look at the histology of the heart valve, it's a little bit confusing unless you know the sorts of sides, the surfaces on which these heart valves are associated with. Heart valves either separate the atria from the ventricle or the ventricle from blood vessels like the aorta or the pulmonary trunk. So sometimes on the surface of the heart valve, you might have an atrial surface and a ventricular surface. If you're looking at the valve between the atrium and the ventricle, sometimes there could be a blood vessel surface and a ventricular surface, depending on whether or not you're looking at a heart valve that separates the blood vessel from the ventricle. So bearing that in mind, when you look at the heart valve, you can identify some histological components, albeit they're rather distorted here because the heart valves are often very hard to fix properly and examine under a microscope. But there is a central core to the heart valve. That central core is called the fibrosa. It's the strong component of the heart valve that joins on with the fibroskeleton component of the heart that I mentioned earlier. And then on top, on the surface that's adjacent to either the atrium or either the blood vessel, you have a thin layer called the spongiosum. The spongiosum or spongiosa, as it's often referred to, is a very thin layer. It's elastic and that helps, helps to dampen the force of vibrations on the heart valve caused by the continual closing of the heart valve during the heartbeat. And finally, the layer below is called the ventricularis. This is the layer of tissue that's adjacent to the ventricle space. And that's dense connective tissue as well. And it becomes continuous with the corda tendony, structures that extend from the heart valves between the atria and ventricles that attach to little papillary muscles inside the ventricle and stop the valves from opening in the wrong direction during contraction of the ventricle. Now let's move on and look at the structure of cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is a specialised piece of tissue so important to the function of the heart. You need to be aware of its difference between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. Well, cardiac muscle does have some characteristic features. Firstly, it's got a central nucleus, similar to smooth muscle, but skeletal muscle, you may recall, has got many, many peripheral nuclei. Cardiac muscle has also got striations, just like skeletal muscle, but unlike smooth muscle that doesn't have striations. And cardiac muscle has structures called intercalated discs, which if you look at the diagram on the left-hand side, it explains what these intercalated discs actually are and what their functional role is. They are of two sorts of junctional complex. One is called the fascia adherens. That's an adherent junction. It holds muscle cells end to end. You know, cardiac muscle cells are small cells relative to skeletal muscle cells. But unlike skeletal muscle cells that are arranged in parallel and their contraction is dissipated onto a tendon to bring about movement at a joint, cardiac muscle cells are lined end to end and join very strongly to each other 
via these adherent junctions. And the other type of component in these intercalated disks are gap junctions. These gap junctions allow the transmission of ions and different messages from one cell to the next. And in so doing, contraction could be initiated at one part of the cardiac muscle and move all the way along through other cardiac muscles in a certain sequence. And that brings about the sequential pumping of the myocardium. You see here in the diagram, these junctional complexes are between two separate cardiac muscle cells and they tend to be a little bit um, disjointed or irregularly arranged between the two cardiac muscle cells. That increases the surface area of this contact from one muscle cell to another and therefore further enhances the very strong bonding between these cells. The gap junctions tend to be isolated on their own as part of this junctional complex, whereas the adhering junctions are also in certain locations. So there's no confusion between the two in terms of their structure and therefore in ter terms of their function. In the previous section I showed you, or previous slide, and explained the histological features of cardiac muscle, you are looking at cardiac muscle sectioned longitudinally. Here, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see two sections taken through cardiac muscle transversely sectioned. On the far right-hand section is a section taken through the myocardium of the ventricle. And on the left-hand side, the section has been taken through the myocardium of the atrium. And if you look very carefully at those two sections, I hope you notice generally that the thickness of the cardiac muscle fibers in the ventricle are bigger than the thickness of the cardiac muscles in the atrium. And that's because, if you recall, the atria are only pumping blood into the left or right ventricle. The ventricles, on the other hand, are pumping blood under pressure into the lungs or into the systemic circulation through the aorta. Therefore, the pump needed has to be a lot stronger. So the cardiac muscle fibres in the ventricle are going to be stronger, larger, wider, because they have to have that stronger pumping action. So you can see subtle differences in the size of cardiac muscles when you compare the atria with the ventricle. And just in summary, it just refers to the, the, the strength of the pump you need to pump the blood from those two chambers. Well, let's look at the conducting system of the heart. The conducting system of the heart consists of the sinoatrial node, the atrioventricular node, and then these bundles of conducting fibres named in various ways, but I don't want to get into those namings in this particular lecture. In the middle section labelled is the atrioventricular bundle. It's embedded with connective tissue. It's cardiac muscle cell. And on the right hand side, you can see the endocardium. And directly under the endocardium, if you look very carefully, often you find evidence of these conducting fibres called Purkinje fibres. Now the atrioventricular bundle is just a large bundle of Purkinje fibres. Those Purkinje fibres then branch out and head down through the myocardium, generally very closely associated with the subendocardial layer. And that's where you can locate them histologically. Let me stress that these conducting fibres of the heart are not nerves. They're specialised cardiac muscle. So if you look at the diagram of the heart, the blue circular structure and the blue lines running down through the myocardium represents these conducting fibres. And the white circular structure up at the top 
that's actually lying right next to the entry of the superior vena cava, is the sinoatrial node. And it has processes, Purkinje fibers or conducting fibers, radiating from that sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node is the pacemaker of the heart. Cardiac muscle, when it developed, has quite an inherent ability to contract. It contracts without any stimulation, except the impulses emanating from the sinoatrial node. However, that sinoatrial node can be influenced by the autonomic nervous system. The firing rate of the impulse can be increased or decreased by external factors, not just nerves from the autonomic nervous system, but by other factors as well. So you can increase or decrease the rate of the heart by influencing the rate of firing initiated from that sinoatrial node. But essentially those conducting fibres are cardiac muscle, but they're just specialised. And you can tell the difference between these conducting fibres from normal cardiac muscle. Have a look very carefully at the central section of the atrioventricular bundle, or even have a look at the Purkinje fibres labelled just under the endocardium. Both these labels, or both these fibres rather, have clear types of components within them. The cytoplasm's less dark stained, and sometimes it's even very, very pale. That's because these cardiac muscles are conducting fibres. They're not contractile. So they don't contain all the contractile proteins all the contractile factory within the cell. They don't need it. So they don't take up stain because they're not there. It's as simple as that. Another way you can tell the difference between the Purkinje fibre, particularly, and surrounding cardiac muscle fibres is that Purkinje fibres often have two nuclei. Remember, cardiac muscle only has one nucleus. So in summary, Endothelium is a very important epithelium because it lines the entire vascular system. And as we go through other lectures in this histology course, I will emphasise all the different sorts of functions that endothelium has. Recall that the atria of the heart receive blood from the systemic circulation or from the lungs. The ventricles are the pump of the heart that sends blood to the lungs to be oxygenated and then it's returned to the left side of the heart where it's pumped by the left ventricle to the systemic circulation. And the wall has got three distinct layers, the outside layer, the epicardium, the inner myocardium, which is where all the pumping action occurs because that's composed mostly of cardiac muscle and then an internal lining, the endocardium, which includes the endothelium, supported by some connective tissue underlying that epithelial layer. Cardiac muscle has only got one nucleus. It's striated. It's branched. It's arranged and joined end to end with other cardiac muscle fibres by intercalated discs which contain adherent junctions to make sure they're bound very tightly together. But also they contain gap junctions to enable transmitters, messengers, ions to go from one cell to the other and importantly bring about a sequential contraction of cardiac muscle. The heart pumps because impulses are generated at the sinoatrial node. And then they're carried across from the atria, across the fibrous skeleton to the ventricles, where they initiate contraction again of the ventricles. And that initiation of contraction of the ventricles is acted upon by the presence of Purkinje fibres. These Purkinje cells transmit the impulse through the myocardium 
to all the cardiac muscle cells within that myocardium. And it's important to know the difference between the cardiac muscle fibres that contract and these Purkinje fibres that just transmit the impulse. Recall that the Purkinje fibres, being just a conducting muscle cell, don't contract and therefore don't have the apparatus to contract, therefore they don't stain as heavily as normal cardiac muscle cells stain. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. I hope you now have a, a good understanding of the histological structure of the heart and the importance of the heart as being a component of the cardiovascular system. Thank you.